Uh, my name is Julie Nichols. I'm a co-host to Real Talk, Real Truth. And this is probably my favorite thing to do <laughs> out of all my duties. I just love doing it, but it's, it's just, I love doing it. And I was so honored when Ron and Cindy asked me to be a co-host. But anyway, and I want to introduce, we have Ron and Cindy, which are the hosts of, of this live stream. And then we have Peter Watts, and he is a published author, and he has served in various ministry capacities. So we're really blessed to have him um, on our live stream tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and read um, the statement of Real Talk, Real Truth. As Christians, we are instructed to test everything that is said and to hold on to what is good. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.21. As the culture around us becomes more confusing and more divisive, it can be difficult to discern what is true, what is false, what is good, what is evil. At Real Talk, Real Truth, we feature open and honest conversations with real people as we strive to view the challenging issues of our day through the lens of biblical truth. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Julie. Thanks a lot for that. And as Julie said, we have uh, with us today uh, Peter Watts, and Peter Watts has a uh, blog post called uh, Faith Rethink. Really good. You guys should check it out. Anybody listening? We'll spaghetti? post links. Oh, yeah, obvious. definitely. Faith Rethink. And he's been a youth pastor in the past. He's currently a teacher. He teaches social studies, health, and English. And he is also an author of this book here. If anybody's interested, it's a good book. Right by the end of it, maybe you can see it. You can mm -hmm. find it on Amazon. It's called Authentic Christianity. And that's what we're going to talk about today is Peter's take on on his book and, and his thoughts on what is authentic Christianity and how can we be better Christians in such a crazy world <laughs> yeah absolutely so um I'm Cindy uh, Ron's wife and um so we just like to have a little conversation with 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 Peter all of us will be will be chiming in but we we, we read his book um it's a beer for anyone who who enjoys reading even if you don't enjoy reading I will just say this book is extremely easy to read it is very good. it is very much it's deep yet simple, if that makes sense. It's deep in the sense that it, it tackles some really deep truths of what it is to be truly Christian. But it's simple in the sense that it's very easy to understand. You don't need a doctor of theology to read this book. <laughs> you could anybody could pick up this book and read it and fully understand because it's a very conversational type of book. Then, um, very helpful. Yes, it, you could take away so much from yeah. it. Very practical. So we highly recommend the book. We're not here to plug the book, okay? But we do want to let you guys know that the book is out there, and we wanted to talk with Peter. With, with our audience listening to kind of to kind of give him the opportunity to share with our audience what he has learned about authentic Christianity through his life through his studies and just through the experiences that he's had in the different capacities that he's been in ministry so Peter the first thing we wanted to ask you is kind of a two-part question how would you define authentic Christianity and how do you think the modern American church church as a whole of course can do better in encouraging Christians to be authentic yeah um so I wrote the book kind of for two reasons. Uh, I was playing off the idea of what is an authentic Christian? What is a Christian in general? Uh, so what does it mean to truly follow Christ? And on the other hand, I was dealing with what does it mean to be an authentic human being? And so I was sort of playing off those two realities that we both follow Jesus and at the same time, we're trying to do that in a way that's actually more human, which is strange to even have to say that. But it seems like what has happened, at least in my experience and so many other Christians' experiences, has been, um, it's like in their attempt to follow Jesus and be a Christian, they have learned a lot of uh, inauthenticity or uh, a, a kind of a false pretense of who they are. They're, they're, they're sort of give off. Uh, well, that's the word. They give off a pretense. It's, it's, it's disingenuous. It's not real. And I, so my book was attempting to at least kind of deal with those two things. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And at the same time, what does it mean to be a, a human being? So uh, the Webster's actually, uh, the definition is the quality of being genuine and true. So I wanted to kind of play that out. What does it mean to be uh, genuine? What does it mean to be a genuine person? What does it mean to be real with people? Um, 
you have other questions to deal with it I, I could keep going but yeah uh, yeah definitely yeah. you know we you know having having read your book I see a lot of that in here and you know one of the things that, that we liked about the book at the end of it's actually the end of the introduction there's a reading and group discussion guide and uh, we read the question together and Ron and I talked about it at home. And, and I think that t- this touches so much on what you say. You know, I, I haven't told any of my testimony here today, but I was raised in a Christian home my whole life. Went to Christian school, kindergarten through high college, never went to a public school, always went to church, you know, was all, had all the Bible knowledge given to me and all of my friends and family were Christian. So um, I can relate to some of the some of the issues here. The question in your book says, why do you think it is so difficult to practice authenticity in churches? And when Ron and I talked about it, we came up with a few things mm-hmm. that we kind of dotted down. One of them is we feel in the churches, so, sometimes there's this, this mentality that there's the pastor is the man of God. And mm-hmm. that the pastor has some t- type of almost <laughs> yeah. superhuman yeah. authority. Not all churches do this, but some some denominations do. Sure. And I think when you when you give one person that much authority, then you have the followers just falling in line. Because yeah. that's what they think they're supposed to do. Okay, I'm supposed to follow line. The pastor's made a rule. I have to follow the rule. And somehow we get this misunderstanding that that's what makes me a good Christian because I'm following all these rules. I knew yeah. I grew up. Um, another one that we wrote down was fear of rejection because again, everyone's following the same rules. Everyone's trying to look the same. Everyone's mm. trying to fit into this culture. And it seems like Christianity has become a culture. Yeah. More than just a relationship with God. And that's not what God intended. So this fear, like, oh, I better be just like everyone else at my church. And if everyone else at my church is singing about joy, 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 Hmm. and I'm not feeling joy, I better not tell anybody because if I tell them, then they'll reject me because Christians are supposed to have joy. Do you do you kind of sense that happening in certain circles? Yeah, I think so. Uh I'm glad you said that because I as as I was talking, I sort of uh was backtracking, didn't know how much I needed to get into it kind of quite in the beginning, but kind of the whole motivating element in the book is in my experience within the church, I, I just felt like there was, we, we learned how to be Christian in a way that was phony, um, at least elements, not everything was phony. I mean, there right. was, there was a lot of personable qualities and personal relationships that I had with people and and in the, my discipleship process in churches, um, mostly conservative churches, uh, almost entirely. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I came to this place when I was serving in the ministry. I was an intern in a couple of churches, then I served as a youth pastor. And I felt like the way that we were training people or, or maybe discipling people was lacking real human qualities. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, I, I wrote a couple things down kind of just thinking about tonight that if you think about it, Sunday morning itself is centered around a stage. Mm-hmm. And as much as I'm a big fan of theater, uh, I've even had some uh, practice acting in the past and I've done some theater work. And so I appreciate the art of acting and the art of theater um, and the, the skill that goes into that. Um, there's something strange when it feels like the church is imitating theater, uh, at least at least fully. Not that planning isn't important and not that preparing a sermon isn't important. I'm very much someone that likes to prepare. But it's it's interesting that the what, what we think of church oftentimes in, in a lot of our contexts is that church is centered around a stage. And it's centered around this idea that we're coming to perform on Sunday. Yeah. Um, I had a whole chapter on the, I think it was chapter three, maybe something real, something true, mm-hmm. where I, I kind of dealt with this idea that we've we've taken this idea of theater and production and performance, and we've capitalized that on Sunday. But what happens when you come to perform? You're not necessarily yourself. You're playing the part of someone else. Right. And so I, I definitely have seen that in my experience. I've struggled with it. I think I still do at times, you know, we're, I think so much of the toxic stuff we were trained in, in within the church is still part of us. And Jesus is helping us over time to kind of deal with that. And we're not fully, uh, we haven't fully recovered. We're still kind of in a process where uh, God is being patient and working with us and kind of weeding things out that are, are just kind of phony. So I, I still find myself do things, doing things around people, even in small groups with my wife, we're part of a small group uh, with a church and 
And I still get into some of those old habits where I'm acting the part of a Christian instead of just being real with people. Yeah. And um, so I've definitely had that experience. Yeah. yeah, I really like and appreciate what you said, because early in my walk, and I, I think you remember me saying this, I think I talked to you about it the other day, I felt as though as time went on, and probably within that first year, I felt like, am I the only one working on things? I mean, I, I didn't hide anything. This is what I'm dealing with. This is where mm -hmm. I'm struggling. And this is where, but as I watched other people around me, it seemed like it, they were just playing the part. And I'm thinking, am I the only one who is able to be real with himself? Mm -hmm. You know, am I the only one that's able to say, you know what, I'm having these thoughts. They're not good thoughts. I don't like this about myself. I mean, you know, God worked on me in, in those areas, but I really felt that way. You know, and again, we come from a fundamentalist circle, but you, you always see, nope, just have joy. Nope, just don't think about it. Nope, just read the read Bible. Bible and, well, yeah. it's really not that simple, you know. Yeah. And you know, and and when you did mess up, you you were almost shunned. I think, you know. Yeah. yeah and I think there's this fear of being shunned. Like, you know, I I, I feel like if you if you were to take, like, say, a hundred people in a church, and they've all been, you know, they're all good, good, good standing members of a church, and put them in the room. If every one of them could take a piece of paper and write down their deepest spiritual struggle without fear of anybody knowing what it was, right? Mm. Throw them into a pot, start pulling them out. Nobody knows who's who, so no one's afraid mm -hmm. to be honest. I think you would find that they have so many in common, but no one knows they have it in common because they're afraid to say it. Mm. And you may have you may have twenty people in the church who are fighting depression, mm -hmm. but all of those twenty think that the other ones aren't. And so sure. I don't want to be the one that says I am because no one else is. And so we all, I think, lead each other to believe that we have this superhuman strength and that we're not, that we're never sad, we're never down. And I think some of that too comes from what the responses that we give people when they come to us with a problem. Like, you know, I think we've all heard this. You know, someone, let's say a woman has a miscarriage and she's, she's sad. She goes to church and someone says, how are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm fine. The Lord's good. No, my baby's in heaven. And she's dying inside, but she's afraid to say, I'm struggling with this. I don't think God was fair. You're not allowed to say that. It's a bad thing to say. So instead of saying what she really feels, she says the things she thinks she's supposed to say. And I know you talked about that in your book too, this idea of trusting other people, that you have to trust people enough to tell them the truth about what you're going through. Because if you don't trust people, you won't share. But if we don't have a community that builds trust, I think we start yeah. teaching people not to trust each other enough, to be honest. If you if you're if you if you're not honest with somebody, it's often because you don't trust them. Like you don't trust them to handle what you want to actually say. So, so I, I think that's I think that's very true. I think that is a contributing factor. One little quote I wanted to read from your book is again from the introduction, and this will kind of segue into our next question. Um, we live in a time when the label or description Christian is often too is all too often polarizing in the political spectrum and wider world, and more often than not for reasons that don't truly reflect or represent the Jesus who shows up on the pages of the New Testament, not to mention our lives today. Like Christians were making too big of issues of things that are not primarily Jesus's issue. Um, no matter your political stances and views, the call of Jesus to be the light of the world means at least that those who follow him should aspire to rise above the political debacles and actually be people with whom others, both Christians and others who may not identify with Jesus or life in him, might discover something good, something real and true. In other words, authentic, that is transformative for their lives. And Christianity is supposed to be transformative. Like Christianity is not supposed to be the culture that we blend in with. It's supposed to actually change us from the inside out. Do you do you mind if I add a little, just a very brief oh, please do. of early yeah. church history? Okay. Yeah. And just most most of the viewers probably know that I'm Catholic. I, I actually came from Anglicanism and became Catholic four years ago. <clears throat> so that's my church background and my faith in Christ is seen a lot through historical eyes but I still have a personal walk um, but it's it's a different it's a different um walk than a lot of evangelicals but that's totally fine we're all brothers and sisters in Christ um the early church uh, it, and I'm in seminary so I this is kind of my bag <laughs> but the early church the earliest Christians did not have a bible um, most of them had the old testament memorized or a lot of them, and so because a lot of the earliest converts were Jewish converts, <clears throat> and you know the church was underground. Christianity was not legal until Emperor Constantine came to the scene in 313 AD, <clears throat> and 
the way these Christians moved the heart of Emperor Constantine to allow the church to come to the surface is that they took care of the most vulnerable in society, the marginalized. They took care of, you know, the sick, the elderly, um, the homeless, the widow, the orphan. They gave their lives, life and limb for neighbor. And what happened is, and they did it unconditionally. They didn't say, well, I'll take care of you if you become a Christian or if you become Catholic. And the, cat, the, the earliest Christians were Catholic. I will take care of you if you do that. And no, it was unconditional love. It was unconditional. And that was what moved the heart of Emperor Constantine. They were also called cannibals, <laughs> the earliest Christians, because they um, partake in something called the Eucharist, which was, um, they believed that the, the consecrated elements became the actual body and blood of Christ. And Catholics still believe that today. So do most Anglicans and Episcopalians. Some, some Lutherans do too. Um, <coughs> but, and so they were uh, accused of being cannibals. If you look at John chapter six, it talks about the eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ. Um, but that's, that's church history. But as far as these, you know, people that were perceived to be cannibals, they were taking care of the most destitute in society. And it moved the heart of Constantine so much that the church came to the surface and the church, uh, all the early church fathers um, give reference to these, the, the historic priesthood and what the early Christians did. Um, to take care of the vulnerable and and let me add all the other things in comparison to taking care of the marginalized that is authentic Christianity is giving life and limb for neighbor giving unconditional love under all circumstances without condition that is real Christianity because then people are going to go why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing this? And it's because of Christ. And right. I, that is the exact opposite of what has been going on in our right-wing politics. So absolutely. I'll give it to Peter now. No, absolutely. And you know what? That actually leads to our next question. So we're going to we're go ahead okay. and use that. That's a great segue. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, our next Julie. question, <laughs> this is kind of a little off, off the book path now at this point, but um, I think it's relevant to the topic because you know, the, the idea of what is Christianity, if we want to know what authentic Christianity is, I think we have to recognize what it isn't. So this question is kind of more along the subject of what is it not. Um, how do you think tribalism and political and social, quote, otherism can hinder our Christian witness? And how can we encourage Christians to transcend politics to reflect the actual Christ of the Bible? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's, there's like, there's a number of things that come up because, um, <coughs> Tribalism in a, in a way doesn't have to mean we can't identify with a group. There's like a positive and negative definition of tribalism. I think we've often heard it in the negative, but just uh, in, in terms of the positive kind of connotation of tribalism, just being able to identify with groups, we all do that. And it's, I think it's, it's natural. We, we were born kind of conditioned to identify as uh, whether it's your gender or your political views or your faith or where you live, you know, some there's parts of New York where they have more pride about being from um, Manhattan as opposed to another side of New York. You know, I think that we I, identifying with a group or a tribe um, is can be a good thing. But I I think the negative side is to, you know, on one level to what extent are we saying that tribe is dictating everything I do? Mm -hmm. And then and the other question as a person who follows Jesus, like we do, uh, to what extent are my tribes maybe that I identify with my, my groups, uh, whether it's your political views or other views, uh, or maybe just the social club you're part of or whatever, uh, do those conflict with your identity in Jesus? And, and I, th I think that what Jesus calls us to, for one, he calls us to himself. Um, and so this new identity is somehow wrapped up in him, in the person of Jesus. But I think it's also wrapped up in the family of God, that 
we all were brought into this huge family that like transcends you know it, it really it transcends culture nation uh you know just like the revelation talks about every tribe nation and language um is coming together uh in christ and so um back to your question which was how does tribalism and uh, sort of hinder or negatively affect our Christian witness. I think to the extent that we don't reflect the love of God in Christ, I think that we we've hindered our witness and, and that's an ongoing thing. Like to, it's an ongoing journey that we're all kind of facing, which parts of my identity that I had before Jesus is still needing to kind of get tweaked. And, mm -hmm. and I think we, we, it's, it's like not a one-time thing. We kind of are, because I think we're, we're, I've studied a little psychology too. I know Julie's in that uh, sphere. Um, and some of my reading on psychology and sociology has led me to think that our identity um, connections that we have with various identities, various hats we wear are deeply part of our psyche, are deeply part of our behavior. And you know, following Jesus should start critiquing some of that. And maybe some of it is in line with Jesus, wherever it's in line with him and, and flows with the love of God, then that part, that stuff we keep. Um, but I think we just have to be open to the possibility that it's, I might have a blind spot or I might have a weakness. And, um, and I think politics definitely comes into this category. And I, and I, I fail, I think, in uh, without getting into who I voted for or where I necessarily stand politically, I, I can be so much, I can have my identity there too much where I just have to be careful that Jesus is still being reflected even in my political views. Right. Um, I mean, we can get into politics, but I, I'm not necessarily wanting to jump there immediately. But right. yeah, it, it, you know, you were involved in a conversation I had last week, Peter. Thanks for your input there. That was good. But that was it was a common conversation that I've had with a lot of people. And you know, like you were saying, our our identity in Christ should transcend our politics. And I you don't know how many people I've talked to where I'm if I don't agree with their politics, I'm called a uh, a leftist or a yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, you know yeah or, or whatever you're so here we have two sides of the spectrum okay if your identity is in christ now we all have bad days right i mean you can't judge somebody by one conversation right, right. Mm. but i've had that same conversation and it's always the same it's as if the identity is more deeply rooted in the political ideology sometimes and it is hmm. in the spiritual because you can usually tell by the way a person speaks where they're getting their ideology or even theology by what comes out of their mouth just saying yeah. you know you shall know them or what's that what's the verse i'm looking how the abundance of the heart of the mouth speaks hmm. so when i hear people call me a, a leftist in a um <laughs> it's hard and, okay who who are they really reflecting well they're really reflecting what they're spending more of their time is maybe they're on the tv more watching political pundits versus yeah. in jesus so we're created in god's image and if we're more wrapped up in god we're going to reflect like you said we're image bearers when we reflect god's nature and if we're reflecting God's nature and we're worshiping, and our worship is upward toward God, we're going to reflect him. But if we're giving our worship to something other, more of our time in worship, and it's deeper in us than God is, what's going to reflect out of our mouth is going to be. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is, is, is that yeah. It? it just seems like that's, sure. that's really a big issue today when Jesus should transcend like you yeah. said earlier, transcend your social your political your uh cultural issues it, it's, we should be able to move past all that and still have that love for one another where mm -hmm. these things don't yeah. yeah i think i think another aspect that comes up for me is this idea that um 
So one way to, I think, avoid that, that some people do, some Christians do, and I've done this too, where you sort of don't stand for something at all. Uh, uh, I'm very much not like that now, but I think there was a time where I was kind of towing the line of uh, maybe it's better to not make a stance publicly about an issue so that others don't put me in a camp. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think the problem there, I know this is sort of a side conversation about tribalism. The problem there is there are things Jesus wants us to stand for when right. we follow him. And, and I mean, things on earth, like uh, your kingdom, like the Catholics often pray, but Protestants should probably pray it more. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We, we need the reality of what God cares about, uh, which I don't think is not it's not just things we don't see, it's things we do see, like caring for the poor or helping widows or just helping friends that live near us who are down and depressed or whatever. And um, so I don't, I'm kind of going on a rabbit trail here, but. No, that's well, good. You know, I wrote down a quote from Martin Luther King and, and it kind of fits right in there. Uh, it, the quote's talking about justice, but he warned that when the church loses its voice for justice, it loses its relevance in the world. And we could interchange that word justice for taking care of the poor, mm -hmm. taking care of the um, oppressed, um, all that stuff, the widow. If we stop doing those things, as Julie pointed out earlier, those are the things the early church did. And they didn't even have to be Christians in order for them to do it. You know, right. said, love mm -hmm. your neighbor as, you're, as you do yourself. When we stop doing that the re revelant seems to um mm -hmm. we lose we lose our witness totally. yeah. Right. yeah i mean and if you look at any of the prophets why do why do why did israel fall because they stopped doing that stuff that's about mm -hmm. that's that's every single prophet it's the same thing it's mm -hmm. it's they mm -hmm. they talk about that stuff jesus quotes isaiah all the time yeah you know yeah. you know if i could just interject one more thing kind of Kind of off that topic, but still on this on this question, you had said at the beginning of your answer, you know, that tribalism isn't always bad, and I agree with you right. because it is human nature to join up with people that are similar to us. Absolutely. But you know, if you we were talking about this the other day, if if an alien from outer space were to land in the United States of America, never heard of Christianity in their lives, and they hear the word Christian, and they were to look on Facebook, they were look on Twitter, oh. they would go in the homes of Christians, they would you know go to the churches and find out what what is Christianity about. I wonder what they would think it meant. And I, I you know, and I'm, I'm not being facetious here because I'm a part of this culture. I can, I can laugh about it because I'm part of it, right? You know, being a Christian to so many Americans, it, it looks like you like Chick-fil-A, <laughs> wear long skirts, you homeschool your kids, um, you vote a certain way, you vote for certain things, you vote on certain issues, mm -hmm. you laugh at Tim Hawkins. I love Tim Hawkins. I'm thinking against him. Oh, he's funny. Yeah hilarious but you know we, we we wear certain t-shirts we listen to certain music we have certain decor on our on our like you know we do we got decor yeah, you know yeah. all these things that we do and nothing wrong with any of those things those things are all fine and those are all mm -hmm. part of our culture right but that's our culture that's not our christianity and i think when christians mm -hmm. when there are a lot of christians <laughs> like there are in our country there are a lot of christians when there are enough people that have something in common they create a subculture right and as christians we have this subculture that is known by certain types of music, decor, t-shirts. You know what we have Christians now, we have our own, you know, pure flex. We have our own video mm. companies and all these things, and that's fine, but it's so easy to start thinking that that's what being a Christian is. And I would say, no, that's our tribe. Those are the, the traits of our tribe, and that's fine, but that's not what being a Christian is. Like you don't have to conform to those things to be mm. a Christian. You can be a Christian and not like Chick-fil-A. You don't have to shop at Hobby Lobby. It's not what makes you a Christian. And I know mm. everybody knows that. Like if you would ask, oh yeah, yeah, I know that. But sometimes I think we we so mm -hmm. easily conflate those things that we forget that Christianity is the word Christ. Christianity, it's a relationship yeah. with Christ. I think. Oh, that's go that's ahead, Cindy. No, go ahead. That's it. That's all I want. No, say. we. I remember the conversation when I first talked with you guys off camera when we were talking mm -hmm. uh, about the importance of reflection, self reflection. That there's something that is missing. I think. At least it was missing with me, and I and I venture to say because I've 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 actually met Christians from a wide variety of Christian denominations. So I, um, I haven't just been in my own particular bubble of whatever. Um, I you know I grew up Pentecostal, but I have a wide, uh, expanse of 
just relationships with various Christians. And I think one of the things that I think is missing, according to them as well, is this idea of self-reflection that, uh, and I think you can do this with the spirit. This is a, this is a p- practice you cultivate. And sometimes we get it wrong and we make mistakes and we probably judge ourselves sometimes too harshly. Mm-hmm. I think that's another problem. We can give our, we, we need to learn to give ourselves grace because God gives us grace. But at the same time, like we have to be willing to be, whether you use the word conviction or guilty, it doesn't matter to me. They're the same thing. I think there's a holy kind of guilt where you realize I've come, I've come to my senses. I've done some pretty crazy stuff or, or maybe it was just small sin, whatever. Um, are not so overt sin, we'll just put it that way. But I think self-reflection um, is so like needed. And I think some of the reason why, um, I mean, I personally tend to see this more in, as, as you were saying, Ron, earlier, right-wing politics. It, I, that doesn't mean left-wing politics or middle of the road that can't also get into this habit where we get so caught up in our tribe that we don't, self-reflect or critique yeah um and um you know we have to be willing to go you know i can agree with this thing with this group Mm -hmm. but i disagree with this yes and uh, there's maybe some yeah and there's some things i can really come behind and then other things that maybe even are a little gray Uh, maybe i don't have a big decision on um and I, I, because I did grow up within a particular mode of thinking, I didn't see this practiced within my, uh, I didn't often see this practiced in my conservative circles. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means I didn't see it practiced as much. So there was often a hostility even that, oh, that when you'd suggest someone would need to rethink something or even be open to the possibility. And so that was actually, that's, sort of getting on a rabbit trail where where I end up leading in my book uh, in chapter five I think where I talked about how can we start pursuing an authentic faith and be authentic human beings at the same time is we have to start practicing humility we act like we all we all don't do this well some of us are really bad at it being humble but we have to at least start cultivating practices where we're willing to apologize, where we're willing to publicly apologize, even in church, or even maybe it's just with our family, you know, just saying, yeah. you know, I was, I was so wrong what I did, or, um, and there, I think, is a, there's a spirit, we could even call it an evil spirit, that I think is working, or spirits, and I'm not one to talk about spirits a lot, I just think that can get, um, yeah, for me personally, I came from a group that always talked about demons. So it was like, I try to, <laughs> it's like there's a demon behind every corner. So right, right. when I bring up spirit, I, I might be meaning being a, serious about this. I do think there's a work of the, of darkness that is uh, deceiving a whole culture of Christianity. We'll call it contemporary Christianity where there's an unwillingness to acknowledge maybe fault. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's just, uh, that's when you go down that road of uh, pride long enough, you, you live in your bubble. You don't, you're not open to anybody speaking critique to you. And, and I've fallen in that too. It's kind of weird. I, I think it's because of the negative that I now have a little bit. I want to be careful who I am sharing uh my closest whether thoughts or or conversations with because there is so much garbage that happens in the church so i'm a sort of on the other end where i'm trying to pursue healthy authentic relationships but there's a lot of garbage too you kind of have to be careful with that like who you share uh who you who you entrust yourself to i was going i was going somewhere with this i think i lost my thought i don't know you know i like what nt Wright said and i've heard it from other people times too I, and, and I'm going to refer to our time now here in 2021 but he made a statement that and I totally agree with this statement every generation has to check itself and make sure mm. is it following Christ the way 
it should be. Are we starting to slide off the wrong? Don't assume wrong. that what the previous generation taught you was perfectly true. Study it for yourself. Right. Yeah. And, and, and mm -hmm. Just to get back on track. I, I, I truly believe right now yeah. we're in that period where we have to kind of recheck ourselves and say, oh, okay, hold on. Mm. How much of it is yeah. tradition and how much of it mm -hmm. is right. true? And that's the deconstruction that Cindy and I are going through. We're, you know, is this is the flag. Yeah, not deconstructing the, the fundamentals of our faith, but just right. some of these little side points that become like, like yeah, like nationalism. Is that yeah. what it is? Yeah, like, nationalism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It doesn't belong there. Right. It, it has nothing to do with Christianity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Do you mind if I add, add just a, a little bit about self-reflection? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm going to put this in a historical context again. Um, Christianity up until the Protestant Reformation, um, we're talking about um, the Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, there were one church until 1054 AD. And then, and there were some other smaller traditions like English Catholicism, and there was um, there was uh, Oriental Catholic, uh, Oriental Orthodoxy, and so on. But there was there were some others, and the practice of regular confession, okay, going to the confessional, and actually doing an examination of conscience. Um, the Ten Commandments were used a lot, the Seven Deadly Sins, but like going through and actually analyzing our spiritual walk and say okay i need to work on this i need to work on this when i go to confession i usually go to about every four to six weeks and i write down what i need to work on okay and i realize i'm con i'm confessing the same sins two to three times the same two or three sins every single time that i can't seem to break and so usually the priest will give me some spiritual direction on how to best break those but that regular practice went on all the way up to the Protestant Reformation, actually went back into ancient Judaism. Like that was not just something that came out of ancient Roman Catholicism. I mean, it would, the, the people would confess their sins to the priest and he would give an atonement of, of an animal. Of course, when Christ came, the, that sacrifice was no longer needed. But that regular practice, it doesn't have to be a sacramental confession, but that regular practice of that, set, that, um, examination of conscience i like to use the ten commandments okay but other people use other things um i'm going to tell you it has it, what it's gone deep in my sake to apologize regularly when i'm doing something wrong to think about maybe how i wronged someone else and not just say it in a confessional where only the priest hears me okay but like going to that person, making amends, I realized after confession a few weeks ago, I realized I really had done someone wrong. And the confession revealed that to me. Yeah, yeah, and that's good. And the Bible tells us that we should confess our sins to one another. But then that right. goes back But people to, don't do that. <laughs> right. But it goes back to what Peter was talking in the book earlier. Yeah. Do we... Yeah, that, honest, right but it's hard to who you trust because sometimes you get this feeling well if i tell this to somebody they're gonna right they're gonna they're, judge they're, me, they're gonna judge yeah. me. And see that's that's sometimes part of what sometimes they are gonna judge you but they have to get past that that's yeah. that's the beauty of a sacramental confession is that that the priest wears a stole and right. so he is actually under the that he cannot reveal what was said in that confession like right. he is sworn to secrecy. Right. And so, I mean, he could, he could, he could be defrocked for that. Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's the problem is that we don't have that mechanism. Um, that's part of the reason I became God because it wasn't really that much of a practice in Anglicanism. That's probably one of the main reasons um, yeah. is that I wanted that, that sacramental confession. It's almost like a counseling session. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, so I mean, not everybody does. That's not everybody's spirituality, but it's definitely mine. So okay. well, that's good. That. Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. that. All right, our next question is kind of on a totally different track. Um, this we got directly from the book, and uh, I actually would like to read your quote, but I'd like to hear it from your own mouth first. So, mm -hmm. um, for for all of our audience out there, Peter Watts' take on this on this concept is biblical. So please, if you miss everything, get this. The question for Peter is, what does it mean when the Bible says that we are a city on a hill? Is it about acting holier than thou, or is it more about how we reflect Christ? In your own words, what do you think that passage means? Um, 
So what, what does it mean to be a city on a hill? You just um, said you're a city on a hill. What did you mean by that in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think the, I think right before Jesus says that you, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Um, it's interesting that Jesus at another time too, I'm trying to think, was it John 8? I, I can't remember, but probably John 8, where he talks about he's the light of the world. Um, in fact, let me read it here. I wrote it down. He says, I am the light of the world. People who follow me won't go around in the dark. They'll have the light of life. So it's the following Jesus is about following the light. Uh, Jesus is the light. And yet we're also reflecting this light. And um, I, you know, I think that it, it can be, that can happen in a thousand different ways, but um, I, I, you know, it could be as simple as we are, we're on this, uh, you know, it, it can be seasonal too. how, how we reflect Jesus in a season or with uh, certain people uh, in, in our surroundings around the job. But I think that to the extent that we understand the love of God in Jesus, that is what we can start attempting to shine. We're not all going to be senior pastors or some great speaker, um, even though I, I wrote a book and I am grateful for that. And it was, I mean, I have tons that I'm still learning and I'm, I'm still trying to practice some of the things I wrote in the book, you know, that, that I fail at all the time. Um, and I think that there's reflecting Jesus is such an ongoing journey and it, it hits us at so many different levels, but it is about Jesus. So if, so is at least for Christians that to be the light has to do with how is it that I'm reflecting Jesus. And we can, I think we can tackle that in a uh, very pharisaical way where it's all about, did I do this and not do this where it's, I mean, rules are good. It's not that rules are not good, but if it's just about rules and not about reflecting the person, then, right. then the rules become meaningless. So yes. it has to, and the commands even become meaningless. Um, and I think that th if the commands don't flow out of, I'm, I'm following Jesus's command, it, right. I think that's, that's where the life giving part of faith in Jesus is. And that's where grace is. That's where the Holy, the work of the spirit is, is it has to do with following this person, Jesus, who we believe is Lord, but he's a person too. And we can't lose sight of the, the person of Jesus in, in the process of uh, shining the light. But it's, I think we're pointing back to him. Maybe that's part of it too. Yeah, yeah. that's it. so good. And you, you know, did I? Well, yeah, I was going to say, and, and I like what you said there, because it, I caught myself, I catch myself all the time where I'm just going through the motions. And when I find, and, you know, doing it, you just, you need, you know, spaciously just going through the motions knowing what it is and how to be a christian and when i fall into that i kind of lose my relationship kind of with jesus because i'm not connected to him in that deeper way to where he can help work out things in my life and i think we can get caught up in that just mm -hmm. going through the motions right. and, and the where people are and regulation you know right and people seeing you follow rules is it what i'm going to read your your quote from the book in a minute here but you know just from from again the what i see in a lot of christian culture mainstream hmm. evangelical circles is it, and I, I i've heard this type of thing even taught where let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works you know? and so the idea is when you go to work you make sure your coworkers know you're a christian you make sure they know that you don't cuss they know that you don't drink they know that you don't smoke they know that you don't go to movie theaters they you're a lady, they see you wearing a long skirt, you know, they see, they see the man with a short hair and the, and it's the tie. And, 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 and that's the, that, that's supposed to be what we do to let our light shine and let people know we're Christians. And it's like, okay, nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong with any of those things. If that's what, how people choose to live, if they believe biblically to live that way, that's fine. But that is not what the world goes. Wow. That person must be a Christian because look right. at that long skirt. Like that's not what draws people to Christ. And right. if you listen to the rest of that verse, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, not so that they'll glorify your culture. It goes back to this culture thing, I think, where we got to make sure we look like Christians. Wear my Christian t-shirt so everybody knows I'm a Christian. And that's not what this verse is telling us to do. Yeah. 
do that if you want. That's fine. You know, it's it's that's weird. No, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. I just wanted to read your quote, but if you want to add before I do. Uh, no, read the no, read okay. the quote. I'll probably come back to it. Yeah, okay. So in the context of that passage, um, this is from the chapter called When Christians Become Human. You said, notice that Jesus say, said the way we live actually catches the attention of people who then in return give God glory in the sense of praising and thanking God. Why are they giving glory to God? What are they praising and thanking him for? There are limitless reasons we can probably think of, but one in the context of Jesus' whole life and teaching is simply that when people notice a group of people who actually live the way Jesus lived, caring more about others than themselves, taking time to love and invest themselves into others, it is a sobering, eye-opening experience. And I love this next statement. People are selfish by nature. So to notice and experience a group of human beings, followers of Jesus, who live differently is something that catches attention. And when this happens, some people will thank God for it. And what I got from that is the thing that attracts the world to Christianity that makes them go, oh, wow, look at those Christians. I want to glorify God. Maybe I want to be a Christian. It's not when they see that we don't cuss or that we don't go to movie theaters. I'm not, not saying that we should cuss and you know whatever you believe about movies, but that's not what draws them in. What draws them in is when they say, wow, look at that selfless person. That's not yeah. normal. Like that's weird how selfless they are. Like you just sacrifice that for me? How, why would you do that? I think someone mentioned that earlier today. Why would you do that? Why would you love me? And when they see that, that's what draws them in. Hmm. Because it, defi it defies the culture. Right. It, defies the, it, it transcends the culture. It, defends, right. it goes beyond the political, beyond the social, right. all that. Hmm. You know, one thing that comes up in my mind too is back to this idea of humility and acknowledging our mistakes or where we fall short um I, I think that because you know i was thinking about this we when i when i wrote that section on he, humility i thought i don't have a lot of examples in my own life of people who at least consistently walk humble you know we all have days where we act in pride and we act selfish and whatever but I just didn't have a lot of people, but I had a, enough of them and enough of good moments where I think they reflected uh, uh, being a servant that I began to see Jesus in that. And that helped me. Mm -hmm. um, and then just reading, I think, the New Testament, too, and, and just kind of taking a deep dive into the Gospels and kind of getting to know Jesus through the Gospels. But I think that there's something that we could glean from by um, just learning from Jesus, learning how to be humble by watching him through the gospels, um, watching how he treats people, watching, because we don't have a lot of good examples. Uh, there, there, there is a lot of pride in the church, mm -hmm. oh, every yeah. church. Oh, yeah. I love Catholic what, church too. Well, I love yeah. what you said. In the whole because, world. Yeah. You know, when I first came to Christ, I came, I was reading the book of John. And that's when I fell in love with Jesus. I'm like, yeah, this is it. This, let's look at look at how he is. Look at this is, you know, that's the man, that's the God I fell in love with. And, mm. and that's my experience when, you know, through the church, I just started thinking of that first year, man. It's just nobody seems to be following this, right? I mean, we should have that you know, you talk about humility. Well, where does the virtue of humility come from? Well, it comes from the first beatitude, core and spirit, right? Mm. And you, you're, you're grateful mm. for what God is He's saving you from sin. He's showing you how to get the sin yeah. and taking care of you. That should create right there. If you have that, because if you don't have the first beatitude, you, you're going to struggle with the rest of them. You're going to have trouble being meek. You're going to have a trouble mourning mm. sin. You're going to have a trouble with a pure heart and seeking yeah. after righteousness all those are going to be hard if you don't have that first one and that's where our humility comes from is is our gratefulness to what jesus did on the cross for us. yeah i think where i was i was heading to then I, I lost my train of thought was thinking about how i think one thing that it catches people's attention is when christians acknowledge we're wrong yes uh, be, because we don't see that enough Mm -hmm. uh, especially in the political world. And by the way, on both sides, if you don't know this, you probably do because you guys seem to be very politically minded. But um, most people within our U.S. Congress identify as some Christian or another, whether it's Catholic, whether Protestant, Evangelical, a variety of uh, uh, Christians, uh, a few Mormon, I would still consider them within the faith. But um, 
that's just where I'm at. So I, you know, there's, and it's having said that <laughs> you don't see a lot of Jesus though. Um, no. And, and so, no. you know, it's, it's interesting that the very people who have very big, a lot of power in our country dictate a lot that goes on, not just the president, but Congress. In fact, I would argue that it, to some extent, Congress uh, has maybe more power. I, I know that the president has a lot of power, but there's, it, these people are very powerful in, in our country in terms of their influence um, on the nation. And so, you know, when you don't have people regularly acknowledging, maybe we made a mistake there, let's come together, let's try to fix this. Yeah. Instead, instead, they're just pointing fingers yeah. instead of trying to come together. I do see it, but it's, it's not in the majority at all. Um, no. No. And there are, there are some humble people in Congress. I, I'm not going to say who I think is humble because that maybe open a firestorm. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it seems to be rare. And yeah. oh yeah, that's it's crazy to me. Yeah, it, it is. And but that's what happens when you know it's like Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You either serve you either love me or hate. You get one, you got to love one or hate the other. And I mean, let's face it, when you get up there in Congress and there's a lot of money flowing, mm -hmm. a lot of power, a lot of power, and it can really influence. Those things can compete with true Christianity for right. sure. Yeah. And, yeah. Really hard to have that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right, our next question. Um, we know you're you've taught history, social studies. So um, again, kind of off the topic of the book. No, two more. Yeah, two more. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll keep these last ones a little. These ones are probably not um, in depth type questions. So I think we can we can do it. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Um, how is your how is your interest or study in history helps your reading and understanding of the Bible, particularly in regards to the way that is often interpreted today? It's kind of an open question. I know we just kind yeah. of yeah. On, on, I'll know, take this. a I'll take a short stab at it. Go yeah, ahead, sure. Cindy. No, go well, kind of just you know be, because we you know as far as the progression of the church and church traditions and you know religious traditions and and how evangelicalism has become what it is today. Do you yeah. see history that can kind of maybe help us to put that into context to understand maybe how how modern Christianity? You know, we, we heard a pastor once say that Western United States Christianity. Is about a mile wide and an inch deep. Like, how did that happen historically? Yeah, that. there's um, there's so many. Uh, I mean, we could spend an hour on this yeah, one question, actually. So invite me back, and we'll talk about. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but no, um, yeah, there's so much uh, about this. So I, just a, a quick background on this. I became a social studies teacher, which is a history teacher, mm -hmm. be, because of my love for history, but. I think my love for history happened partly because of my love for the Bible. And what I mean by that is the more I begin to see how understanding historical context sheds yeah. light on things in the Bible, oh, yeah. the, the more that actually leaked into my interest in just world history and, and how the history of uh, Christianity or the Christian faith has influenced Western civilization, which oh, yeah. is another fun topic. Mm -hmm. um sometimes in horrendous ways um yeah yeah so um you know before before constantine christians believed you didn't pick up the sword at all i mean that's a whole yeah. other oh yeah uh a whole other topic and now we justify all <laughs> kinds of violence in the name mm -hmm. of religion and even in the name of jesus and i and i think find that very questionable because jesus told peter to put away his his sword um oh, he did yeah but anyway so all that to say that i see i see the the cash value of history not literal cash but metaphorically how history impacts our understanding of history will impact everything we do and that doesn't mean everybody's going to be a historian right it, it doesn't even mean everybody's gonna be a bible scholar i mean i i have even just people that I've come in contact with, I have relationship with other Christians. I'll recommend some easy to read commentaries. You know, um, even those can be very helpful because they help get people thinking about context. And mm -hmm. I, I think there's this misnomer that all I need to do is pick up the Bible and I'm going to, 
that somehow it's going to make perfect sense. And I, I do think that God can use anything. So on the one hand, I might go, I might say that God can use anything, even a misunderstanding of the Bible to teach you something, but, but at the same time, there's, there's a lot of value in trying to understand context Mm -hmm. and uh, no one gets it perfectly. I mess it up too. And I'll have a friend that'll go, well, you might consider this actually that I'm not sure you're reading that right. And I just have to be open to hearing that. Yeah. Um, we do but, that all the time. Yeah, I think history it, it is huge. Um, even even just sticking with the Gospels, there's something about understanding what Jesus walked into in the first century yes. that helps understand the the passion story a little better. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, if anything in the entire Bible that we should at least start gaining a little more historical context, it's the Gospels because I think we've heard it so often told in a certain way that we've actually missed a lot of what's going on there yeah I agree. um and i think we've majorly uh, uh, with a with all branches of christianity to some extent or another have um really missed jesus and we've misinterpreted him oh and, yes and some some of that will come into focus if we just start reading it in context mm-hmm. yeah and, and, and you say that and, that, and that's awesome to say that because you know, one of the things, you know, over this last year, because of all the craziness in the political world over the last year and a half, what it's forced, I mean, I I, I about walked away. <laughs> you know, I'm like, nobody practices this. I almost did. I, but I, yeah. you know, stuck with it because, you know, finally it comes to the conclusion, I don't follow men, I follow Christ. And the way is narrow, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the path is narrow. And I always try to keep that focus. And um, I was going somewhere. But you talk about history. One of the things we've tried to do is I want to try to, I, the best that I can, put myself, my being, in the year 29 AD, 30 AD. What was going on around there? What, you know, in any story I read in the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, whether, you know, who's Paul writing to, what's the context of which he's writing? Mm-hmm. You know, here's an example where he talks about women aren't allowed to pray in the church, but then in another passage, he says they are. <laughs> So what was going on there? Well, later I threw more reading. And, and But because of the political thing, it's forced me to go deeper into right. the Bible is what it's done. Yeah. It's pushed me to go deeper and to see where what junk is in there that needs to come out. And it's helped me draw closer to Jesus, if that makes any sense. Yeah. By context and, under, and, and understanding. Yeah. But, you know, you talk about reflection, and that's something I, I truly believe today you know the church as a whole not any individual church you know mm-hmm. i don't want to paint a broad brush yeah. but the church gets it wrong sometimes right sure. yeah mean, history, we we see it and i i found it i found a few times and i and i, I kept them on my computer here to show a few times where where the church has just got horribly wrong great things like you said for civilization for humanity let's keep that yeah, in mind it's human is that we purpose we had the crusades right yeah they, and the inquisition Yes, yes, the Inquisition. They killed during the Crusades. They killed two hundred million people. I mean, yeah. two hundred thousand or something like that. Muslims and Jews in the name of God, right? So we mm-hmm. got it horribly wrong. There was another one I was reading in here. Um, the uh, apartheid in um, South Africa with mm. Nelson Mandela. It talked about that. How and similarly segregation here in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. And, very similar with segregation. Justified by the Bible in many cases. In many yeah. cases, you know, so, yeah, we, 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 and that's why we need self-reflection. Like yeah. we said earlier, N.T. Wright said, you know, we need to, every generation needs to re go back yeah, and not say. To carry on the traditions. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. right, because Jesus said, and when he was talking to the Pharisees, because I, I, I kept it, I marked it, I think. <laughs> I thought I did anyway. Yes, I did. You know, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, this is what's, I, I, I just highlighted this today. And it's in Mark chapter seven, verses six through eight. He said to the Pharisees, and he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me in mm. vain. Do they worship me teaching as doctrines right. of commandments of men? Mm. You leave the commandments of God and hold on to the tradition of men. And I think right mm. now, going through a similar time right now where we're holding on to a lot of traditions of men and not going, you know, 
take the chaos with it, and I'm not going to go deep into this either. It's one of the hot button issues today: masks and vaccines. Oh gosh! Right. <laughs> and I don't want to get into that, go into that, but, but but here's the thing: in a situation like that, are we going to scripture to make our decision, or are we basing our decision based on, well, it's my freedom, it's my right, it's based on what our tribe says, yeah. right? Based yeah. on what our tribe yeah. says. I, and I think there's a real disconnect there right now, especially. I'm just going to say on the right side of the um, political aisle. Why are we not going to scripture to find out what the answer is? Instead, we're going to the traditions of men. Yeah. Yeah. Even if even if we take that subject and we assume for a second that it, it, there isn't a right or wrong. I actually do think there is, but let's assume that there isn't a right or wrong. Even if we take things like Philippians 2, where Paul says, have this attitude or this mind that's also in Christ. Yes. And he goes into, I think I wrote it down here. I may not have the passage, but it talks about all these different things of um, coming together and having the same mind. Mm -hmm. And then he explains what it means to have the mind of Christ, mm -hmm. who he says, Jesus being the, in the very nature, God humbled himself and obeyed this call to die he mm -hmm. said even even to death on a cross mm -hmm. so our this call of serving others is is so willing to serve them to the point where we can sacrifice everything now we're, we're obviously not all gonna die for for jesus we might be put in that situation but a lot of it's just daily how do we how do we put our own interests aside for a second? Not that those interests aren't important, right. but how do, how do we put them aside for a second? And yeah, a lot of the rhetoric of, of anti-mask, I already heard some of your, uh, your COVID um, session episodes, so I know kind of where you guys are at. And, and, and I'm in the, I'm in a, the same place, um, just blogged about it also. So there's this idea that if we're so like anti because we're asserting our rights like that has nothing to do with the christian faith yeah e even if it's a neutral issue even if there isn't a right or wrong like let's say there's not a right or wrong wear a mask not the attitude behind anti-mask exactly. is like nothing to do with jesus whatsoever oh. it actually right. sounds more like the work of the the enemy yeah and it is. Yeah, anyway it is it oh. is Right, and this is where 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 we where I truly believe in a situation in that is where we're totally taking the second greatest commandment, love thy neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. and throwing it. We're throwing it away. We're we're just saying no. If we're if if we're going to see and be able to make right spiritual decisions, I think that's probably you know the way we should see things is to say when I'm viewing anything. Love my neighbor as myself. Love my neighbor as myself. If we look through that yeah. lens, what would our decisions look like on a daily basis compared mm -hmm. to what we're doing now? Sometimes I think, I, I'm going to go ahead and say it, it's not always not completely how I feel, but sometimes I think that American individualism can sometimes block out that ideology, that this individualism, I have the right to do what yeah, I want. It can go too far. Yeah. yeah. And... And Two ends of the spectrum that can both be problematic, right. but sometimes it can go too far. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I know we're a little over time, and if everyone's okay, that's fine with, with me. Um, to, to our audience, I'm telling you this last question. We're going to get some good information, so hang with us for ten minutes, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll just answer this one quickly if you don't mind. Um, we 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 have this question because we see a lot of what we call Christian nationalism in our culture today. So we kind of wanted to get your take on this kind of from a historical biblical perspective. Do you believe that the United States resembles biblical Israel? Or is it more like Rome, Babylon, or Egypt? <laughs> in America have a biblical view of ourselves in this sense. Why or why not? A lot of times I think Christians in America see ourselves as if we are like Israel. We're right. God's chosen, like a chosen nation. Is that an accurate or not. of the United States of America today? What do you think? <laughs> That's another one we can spend a whole episode on. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think that at least what if if you do you mean biblical to mean what was the best version of ancient Israel, what God called them to, kind yeah. of? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I hear Reagan say, "We're a city on a you know, he, we're the city on a hill, you know." Yeah, you can use that. Oh, that's true. They use that. That's kind America of America have a special calling of God that other countries don't yeah. have. 
podcast is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I buy into all that, especially trying to prove it from the Bible. Um, I see people do a lot of mental strange gymnastics with that one, but, um, but I, I'm okay with saying that a nation could be used by God. It's just so often the way that it's used though is very prideful and very arrogant. Mm -hmm. and and you have to if if we are going to say god called america to do anything we have to say well, what's the fruit of that and are they were they following jesus to some extent i would say yes and to some extent we failed miserably but i don't think it's fully we haven't fully reflected jesus in some ways in other ways we have but i don't even go that route of god i think god is let me get to your question. I almost got on a uh, tangent there. But I, I think, you know, in, in the book, I talk about how Israel, their original calling was to, to be a blessing, that God called them to bless the nations of the world, that in Abram, or in, who became Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. I mean, this is the original, this is the Abrahamic promise. Mm -hmm. And this is what a lot of the Bible ties back to. Even Jesus, I think, weaves what he's doing back to Abraham. I think he does that with David too, but um, it, it, he, he sort of weaves this together. Abraham and David, that promised to David that one would come along his throne. And anyway, all that to say that in some sense, you know, I think where a ancient Israel failed at that, and I get into this, I think in, I, it's probably when Christians become human, I think in that chapter, where um although it might be in uh the one the uh, beyond the self-made project book. yeah i think, I I think it's chapter four beyond the self-made project where i i kind of talk about um that ancient israel's sin biggest sin you know this is my own opinion but i i do think it bears out in the old testament is there one of their one of their big sins is that they went inward mm -hmm. and whenever we go inward and we forget about the world a lot of stuff happens and they went so inward that they even were enslaving their own people. Uh, there were indentured servants. Some were even, there was a harsh economic suppression. The whole book of Amos in part of Amos's prophecy against Israel, or maybe it's the kingdom of Judah, but it's the, the remnants of Israel is they were oppressing their own people. And he was talking, he was yeah. kind of saying, and this wasn't just spiritual oppression. They were economically oppressing their own people, um, taking advantage. Kings and priests were taking advantage of the people of God. So I think Israel's big sin is they went inward. And then, and then I talked about how Rome's big sin, the Roman Empire, was that they tried to dominate others. Oh, yeah. But even to some extent, yeah, even to some extent, Israel did that too. If you if yeah. you if you follow the Israel's monarchy, they even were acting in ways that the world was acting. They were right. physically violent to some of the uh, nations surrounding them that God didn't even tell them to go. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's kind of a whole other can of worms to violence in the Old Testament. But they're they're they were doing things that resembled the violence of the pagan nations. Right. And so when Jesus starts saying things like put away your sword and um, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And he starts talking as if following him includes not acting like the Romans, not being aggressive, violent people and hostile people to make your point known. Um. It, it was supposed to cause a double take, like, okay, Jesus is claiming that to follow him, to follow God's kingdom means to do things very differently than the world is doing. Right. Um, right. So I don't know if I totally answered your question. Do you believe the United States? I, I think in some ways we followed the errors of ancient Israel and Rome. We've, yeah, I agree. We've, 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 to some extent, along our history, we've been very blinded by money, and 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 that doesn't mean that I'm somehow a communist. I I'm not at all, uh, because there's dangers even in that economic system. Right. But um, there's 
yeah, we've gone inward. We've been careless. We've made money. Wall Street is like big on ev- a lot of people's mind every day. Right. Right. Um, money makes the world go ra- around. And I think America has been very greedy. Um, so we've been like Israel in that sense. And we've also been like Rome because we've sometimes been in too many places around the world with our might, military might and showing our power. And I, I just don't think that I get that we live in a world where this stuff happens and, and it's hard to, uh, it's like, well, what would happen if we didn't have militaries and didn't have right. these checks in the world? I get that that's an important conversation. Um, but to see my fellow Christians be so quick to assert uh, America's military power as if that's supposed to be what we're all about, yeah. showing our iron fist. I mean, that's that has nothing to do with Jesus, in my opinion. Uh, it's antithetical, really. Yeah. yeah. And you made two great points. You know, you talked about Wall Street. You know, the Israelites had a calf. We got a bull. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> we got a bull sitting in front. You know, yeah. I, you know, and you yeah. talk about you know, at times, you know, one of the things that it turned me off of the former president was one of the things that I liked about him when I when he first came in was, you know, when he dealt the way he dealt with North Korea, when North Korea was acting up, he said, look, you mess with us, we're, we're going to hit you. Stop. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. You're, you're protecting us. But then as we got closer to the election time and I started paying attention again, it was turned inward on fellow American citizens who didn't agree with his idea, the exact same thing we were talking about, you you turn that vengeance inward on your own citizens, what's going to happen, you know, you're, yeah, that's where your division starts to come in, because, so I'm not American, because I don't, (laughs) you know, when your leader is turning that, that, that malice in that, you know, on their own citizens, it's not good, you know, Mm -hmm. I love the balance of your answer, you know, that, that, we as we we as a, as a nation have done a lot of good, and yeah. I agree we have. Absolutely. We did a lot World War Two. We did a lot of good. We've done a lot of good in this country, but mm-hmm. we've also done a lot of evil. And I I feel like one of the one of the tendencies that we see among again our evangelical circle is this extreme diehard patriotism. Where yes, we should love our country, Absolutely. but we shouldn't just America first, America first, America first to such an extreme that. Yeah. You know, we just, ignore the sins that we've committed as a country or that we are against people from other countries because we think we're superior yeah. one thing you mentioned in that quote that you talked about in your book I, i'm not going to quote it perfectly and i put the book down but you said something to the effect that the jews the jews started seeing the gentiles as people to be conquered or as enemies i believe mm-hmm. instead of seeing them as someone they were supposed to bless I don't know if you remember that quote that you said. And and that's the idea is, yeah, we can be happy to be Americans. We can be thankful for Mm -hmm. America. It's a great country. But this idea that we're somehow superior because God has blessed us. No, God God doesn't love us any better than he loves any other country. And 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 every ancient ancient nation's done that too. So even though that was a sin of ancient Israel, um, to be fair to them, every nation has been, including America, has been... uh, Mm-hmm. oppressed others and been self-centered and yeah uh, hated other people just because they came from a different nation or maybe they're like today or just because their skin color is different or whatever yeah. um yeah. human nature right. but i think that's the reason why we as christians need to be careful that we can love our country but not worship our country yeah. we have yeah. to acknowledge our country's not perfect and in, 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 in like with the polarization today when you you know, again, we come from a conservative circle. And one thing I notice in my conservative circle is that we're told that Democrats are our enemies. Yeah. yeah. They're not Christian. Mm-hmm. There's there's that inward again. Where yeah. we're, us versus them. Right. Yeah. Us, an us versus yeah. them mentality. And I see it more right than I do. I'm not saying it's not on the left because it is. It, it, you, you see it everywhere. But I think it's, it's more prevalent. Nature. Right. You see it more prevalent. But that's exactly the opposite of what jesus told us to do yeah <laughs> you know it, it, it's it's the total opposite i may not agree i don't agree with any political party on everything i just don't i'm not i've, I've been freed from that you know that's exactly what one of the chains jesus broke me from and the closer i drew to him hmm. so when i see that I, it, it just it why are we teaching that in our churches? Why are we in our little, they don't come right out, usually out loud, say it's some do, but mm. it, it's in there. It's, yeah, them Democrats, they're, they're, they're not of God. They don't, it, well, why are, it drives me nuts sometimes. Well, me too. You know, I, my favorite, 
um, religious order in the Catholic Church are the Jesuits. They're the social justice um, mm. progressives in the church. <laughs> a lot of people don't like them. I love them. And one of my favorite Jesuit priests, his name is Father James Martin. Um, and he was appointed by Pope Francis, but he's always working to build bridges with people mm -hmm. at communicable bridges, uh, interreligious bridges, bridges with society. That's, that's what they do. Um, social justice. But one of the things I love, he says, it's not us versus them. It's just us. Hmm. And it, it shouldn't be us versus them. We're one nation. Right. And it, it's it we're, we're gonna it, this is why this has turned into a civil war because it's been one side pitted against the other and then, yeah and we definitely have to and this is why i really think this we're in that generational time where the church has to step back and say okay are we reflecting jesus or are we reflecting our culture because yeah jesus is the it's all about reconciliation right, it's right. Mm -hmm. everything it's about relationship jesus was about relationships and reconciliation and we're not reconciling with anybody if we're trying to dominate i don't think jesus 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 was a servant leader right mm -hmm. <laughs> it was how can i serve you <laughs> not how you can you serve me right and dominate he over came to minister not you, to minister right? to you never see in jesus ministry ever except for with the pharisees where he goes to the culture oh you're in sin you shouldn't be doing that and we have to take a step no he built relationships <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> And, and we're taught I'm, I, in some of the, especially the evangelical circles, I'm, I'm in, I know that we have to take a stand against other people's sin. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. My own. Uh -huh. I've got my own baggage to deal with. <laughs> it seems like Jesus's biggest thing that he went after are, were people who were excluding others. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, if there was anything that made him more angry, it was how he kept people free. How, how others were keeping uh, their people or whether it's their sick or their children from coming to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was like, that's what made Jesus mad. And that's interesting. I think we got that backwards. What we, what we talk about when we use the word inclusive and exclusive, he got, he was mad at their lack of including others mm -hmm. into uh, faith conversations or into mm -hmm. the mercy of God and the grace of God. Yeah, right. Matthew 23, 23 says, uh, you Pharisee, you hypocrites, you tithe your mint, your cumin, and your dill, but you fail to take care away your measures of the law, justice, mercy, and yeah. faith on this love. I mean, he told them right there, you're excluded. You're not taking you. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and I think we're falling into that trap right now as in the wider church where we're being yeah. exclusive. You can't come in. You're not, you know, so, yeah. Okay. Anything else? I think that covers yeah, that it. Covers it. All right. Well, it's so nice to meet you, Peter. Good You're to meet you, you too, Julie. I met Ron and Cindy earlier, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's so much with them. We appreciate it so much. And for those and, watching, we know yeah. we're on a different night tonight. Yeah, we, we kind of flip flop nights, but that's okay. Yeah, that's right. And um, you know, thank and, you. For us. And to our audience, please check out the book Authentic Christianity. Yeah, it's available on Amazon. You will. He, you. I, I promise you. Peter Watts did not come on here to make money off his book. That's not what this is. This is not a shameless plug, but I'm, I'm just telling, I'm just telling you this book will bless you. I, I'm just, that's for me. This isn't Peter asking us to say this. this oh, is I'm sure it's one. Having read the book myself, it's, it's so real and so easy to read. You can read it in an hour. You can sit down and read the book in an hour, two hours. It's not a long book, not difficult to read. And it's, it's just, it's, it's like sitting, talking to a friend over coffee about what Christianity really is. It, yep super super helpful so we would strongly encourage it we'll put we'll put a link to your blog on our page as well so that our viewers can um check that out read what you got in there and um with that thanks guys let me uh say a prayer before we go and thanks everybody for joining us uh dear heavenly father we do thank you for this night tonight this chance to get together and to try to get to know you better Father, we just, that's what we long for is to be more like Christ, Father. And I just ask that this be a blessing to anyone who heard it. And Father's definitely been a blessing to us. And we are definitely grateful for all that you do for us, Father. And we just, just ask you to guide us in our thoughts and in our ways and how we communicate with people. And 
correct us when we're wrong, help us to be willing to have a humble spirit to hear you and to admit when we're wrong and just help us to be that light in the world again. Help us to get back to where we're supposed to be. Help us to be authentic Christians in our walk, Father. We do thank you. Pray this in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Amen. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. You guys have right. a good night. You right. too. We'll have to keep tabs soon. Uh, yeah, definitely. 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 Sure. I, let's go off live and stay on for one second. Can okay. you guys stay on sure. for one yes. second? Yeah. yeah.